Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Van Den Kirkhoff, the Director of the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Mount Royal, and it's my pleasure to be the MC for today's event. And as we start the announcement, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, land we gather on today is Treaty 7 territory. I honour and respect the land, people and cultures of Siksika, Figani, Ghanai nations and Nitsipi Blackfoot Confederacy and the Dene of Sutina. The Shiniki, Bearspaw and Wellesley nations of Ahae and Nakoda and I also acknowledge this land as home to Métis Treaty 3, Region 3. Welcome to Mount Royal University located on Mokinsis, which is the Blackfoot name for the city of Calgary. I'd like to recognize our guest today, Demetrius Nicolaides, Minister of Advanced Education, Dr. Chad London, Provost and Vice President, Academic Mount Royal University, Paul Rossman, Vice President, Advancement Mount Royal University, Lydia Shuton and Nancy Tran, Mount Royal University nursing students, and Joseph Nguyen, SAMRU president. Thank you all for joining us today. And in terms of order of events, we will first hear a few words from the Government of Alberta and then the Mount Royal uh, students. There will be an opportunity for, opportunity for media questions at the end. And so to begin, I'd like to invite the Advan Minister of Advanced Education, Demetrius Nicolaides, to say a few words. Minister Nicolaides. Well, Liz, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you, of course, to Mount Royal University uh, for um, for hosting us here today. I was uh, just reminiscing when I was here uh, several years ago. It was still Mount Royal College at that time, uh, but uh, still very much enjoyed the time that I had here. Uh, just spent one year. Uh, taking a variety of different courses uh, before uh, heading off to the U of C. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to, to be to be back on campus. And in fact, I think I had a couple of, of classes in this in this very wing just just down the hallway. So always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank as well um, Lydia and uh, Nancy, uh, who are both nursing students, uh, for for being here today. Who are going to provide a couple of remarks, uh, which will probably be way more interesting than mine. Uh, so I'll get through uh, my my speech here, so we can hear from uh, from them. More importantly, uh, but here today uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about um, expanding. Uh, important financial assistance to help low-income Albertans enter uh, and strengthen our healthcare sector. Um, over the the past uh, few few weeks and months, I've heard quite a bit from students across the province about uh, the need to ensure that uh, post-secondary uh, education is affordable. Uh, as a former student leader myself, I believe uh, strongly, along with Alberta's government that costs should not be a barrier to higher education. And that's why last year, the uh, Alberta's government created the New Beginnings Bursary. This bursary helps to ensure that all Albertans have the chance to access the skills and the training that they need to build successful careers. More specifically, the uh, New Beginnings Bursary was created in June of 2022 with a $15 million investment over three years to support 1,000 low-income students studying in high-demand programs with an annual $5,000 bursary. Last fall, we were able to provide an additional $3.5 million to this new bursary to support an additional 700 low-income students, also with a $5,000 bursary. With that funding, we are able to support each Alberta student that meets the eligibility criteria for the bursary. In total now, 1,700 low-income students have received the $5,000 New Beginnings Bursary for the 22-23 academic year. But with today's announcement, we are doubling that number. So 3,400 students will be able to receive the New Beginnings Bursary. And so it gives me great pleasure to announce today that Advanced Education will be in investing an additional eight and a half million to the New Beginnings Bursary to support an additional 1,700 low-income nursing students in particular. Alberta's government remains focused on making life more affordable and post-secondary education more accessible. 
Today's announcement is just the latest step the government is taking to make education more affordable and as well improve our healthcare system. As I mentioned, 1,700 nursing students will now be eligible for the expanded New Beginnings Bursary and will be eligible to receive a $5,000 one-time non-repayable bursary. There will be no need to apply for the bursary as recipients will be selected automatically from student loan applicants who meet the program and financial eligibility criteria. The bursaries have been fully allocated and recipients are in the process of being contacted by Alberta Student Aid as we speak to receive their bursaries. To note, today's investment of $8.5 million will fund bursaries for nursing students for the 22-23 academic year. However, nursing, uh, nursing program students will now permanently be included in the list of high demand programs eligible for the New Beginnings Bursary. Therefore, nursing students will remain eligible to receive the new bursary in the years to come. This funding will go a long way to help low-income Albertans be part of our uh, health workforce and as well help them to access our incredible and world-class post-secondary system. The expanded funding also aligns with other initiatives the government is taking, more specifically under the guise of the Healthcare Action Plan. Those initiatives include the recently announced Rural Doctor Strategy, our work to expand bridging education for international nurses, and expanded funding of micro-credentials to include health programs. This also builds off last year's targeted enrollment expansion, where we invested over $26 million to create nearly 2,500 new seats in healthcare-related programs. That included, in particular, uh, uh, over 1,300 new spaces in nursing, 1,090 new seats for healthcare aides, and 46 new spaces for paramedicine. Alberta's healthcare action plan will help build a better healthcare system that supports the needs of patients while setting benchmarks for success. This new expanded financial assistance program is laying the foundation for affordability and success for students. In closing, again, I just want to reiterate every Albertan deserves access to high quality education. Cost should not be a barrier and Alberta's government is working to ensure that all Albertans have the opportunity to learn and train for a rewarding career. Thank you again to Mount Royal University for hosting us um, today. I look forward to seeing the results of this expanded new bursary and the positive impact it will have on students and our healthcare system. Thank you once again. Thank you, Minister Nicolaitis. And now I'd like to invite Lydia Schutten up. Lydia is one, our third year student in the nursing program to say a few words. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you very much for the introduction, Elizabeth. So hello and good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming this morning. My name is Lydia Schutten, and I'm a third year Bachelor of Nursing student here at Mount Royal University. The extension of the New Beginnings Bursary to Nursing is, a, is an important new support for students like me. I've always been drawn to working in a healthcare setting and started working in the area as soon as I could. I started as a recreational assistant in hospice care when I was 16. Working with a vulnerable group really showed me that my skill set was for caring for people, especially at the end of their lives, and I found my passion there. I've wanted to make a difference for marginalized groups and vulnerable populations since then. After upgrading my high school courses, I entered the nursing program in 2020. I've loved it ever since, and I've really found my calling here. However, as we all know, post-secondary schooling and life in general takes a lot of time, effort, and money. On top of our classes, labs, and homework, finances are usually one of the things that are on the top of minds for students when we think about school. This is definitely true for my family and me. While my husband works full-time to afford housing and school for us, I've also been working two jobs alongside my studies in an attempt to save up for schooling. 
A bursary like the New Beginnings bursary would have made all the difference to me in my first years of the program. It would have taken so much stress off my shoulders during schooling and allowed me to really hone in on my studies instead of spending all my free time working. It would also make me feel that the money I was making could be set aside for my future. So many nursing students I know have to spend their time focused on working alongside school, leaving little extra time for socialization, studying, or joining groups for extracurricular activities. This new nursing bursary would allow students to challenge themselves in their studies and go the extra mile in their learning and extracurriculars. As future nurses, we're going to be the key players in our healthcare system very soon. I hope that my fellow nursing students at MRU and in nursing programs across the province will receive this bursary and open the door towards opportunities that might have been unreachable otherwise. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lydia. And now I'd like to invite Nancy Tran, a fourth year nursing student, to the podium to say a few words. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. It's so nice to see you all here today for this announcement of a new opportunity to Mount Royal's nursing program students and nursing students across our province. My name is Nancy Tran, and I'm a fourth year Bachelor of Nursing student at Mount Royal University. I went into nursing because I wanted to help people in the same way that the nurses I've met growing up have helped my grandma, who has spent a lot of time in the hospital. Nurses are essential to our healthcare system. They are not only the faces that patients see the most, but they also contribute specialized knowledge to help advance medical research, innovation, and professional practice. The skills and knowledge we gain during our training as students shape not only our careers, but the future of nursing in Alberta. As we all know, nursing is a demanding profession. Perhaps to help prepare us for this, our schooling is pretty rigorous as well. From classroom learning to simulations, research and clinical practice, we are getting a thorough education here as we prepare as we prepare our, for our careers. With that being said, as a student, there are so many things to keep on top of, both in and out of class. One of the biggest challenges I faced during my time in school is finances. While my classmates would hold part-time jobs during their studies, living at home with my grandma and younger sister meant I spent a lot of time caring for my family while the working members of the household worked full-time and I made use of student loans. Financial supports, like the New Beginnings Bursary Stream, being introduced today, will help to alleviate some of the stress. Support like this could mean that we may not need to work so many hours at our part-time jobs, dip into our savings, or draw as much from student loans. It is so much easier for us to focus on our education when we don't need to worry so much about money. I hope that many of my fellow nursing students, both at Mount Royal University and at other schools across Alberta, will receive and benefit from this bursary in the near future and in years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you again, uh, Minister Nicolaides and Lydia, for saying some more, few words today during this announcement. And I'd just like to say a final few words. Um, today's announcement is certainly good news for nursing students in Alberta. Graduates of MRU's nursing programs make invaluable contributions to our healthcare system and to the community at large. At no time in our history have these contributions been more important to sustaining a healthy and functioning society. Increased access to financial supports, such as this new bursary, help our students to focus on their education and fulfill their immense potential. I want to thank all of our speakers for their commitment to support healthcare training in Alberta. This concludes the formal portion of today's announcement. So I'd like to thank you all for being here and I invite Sam Blackett, Press Secretary, to come take over from here. Thank you. We'll now go into the media Q&A portion of the announcement. Uh, if there are any reporters on the line, please enter the queue if you have a question. Um, we'll start off to see if there's any questions here in the room. There's a podium just to the right side of the cameras here. If there's any questions of the room, could you make your way there, please? And we'll go with one question, one follow-up today. Over yeah. to you. All good. Hi, uh, Laurence Brisson Dubreuil with CBC Radio Canada. Uh, so, I mean, I guess this is a bit more of a clarification. So, you said that 1,700 students had already received a bursary for uh, the year 2022-2023. Uh, I'd like to know whether those bursaries came from uh, the 8.5 million announcement. 
Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah, we've been able to uh, through uh, through the student portal and primarily through the the student um, student loan uh, system, uh, been able to identify recipients based on the financial eligibility criteria, and we're in the process now of beginning to distribute those dollars to uh, to recipients. Good uh, follow up. So just um, with that eligibility criteria, uh, so I know students aren't applying and rather are selected based off of those criteria. Um, are there some factors in there that are being considered uh, being considered such as I mean, just prioritizing marginalized groups uh, and such? Yeah, absolutely. The the priority is uh, the, the the real essence of the establishment of the New Beginnings Bursary going back to last year, uh, as, as is I think contained in the titles, is really um, intended to provide assistance to those who really need it the most. Um, because I think we can all agree there's incredible power in, in education and in post-secondary education allows individuals to create a better future for themselves and their community. Um, and sometimes financial barriers can get in the way. Uh, of, of individuals uh, being able to do that. But if they had the ability to, to access post-secondary education, they, they could create um, a new start for themselves. So, so that's, uh, that, that's the primary target um, demographic and group are individuals, um, uh, lower income individuals who need the financial assistance. Um, we, we have um, an income threshold, income threshold levels uh, based on family size, as an example. I, I won't go through all of it, but uh, as an example, um, for a family size of one, so one individual, um, the income threshold is set at 33000 So anybody that's earning 33000 or less would automatically be eligible to receive the bursary. If it's a family of two, it's, it's $46,900. Um, and of course, scales depending on the family size. Okay. Can I have another follow-up? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> you really twisted his arm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one else is lined up. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any uh, any figures for us, just in terms of those different demographics which have received uh, already the bursary. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I don't in front of me. Um, but uh, you know, as I've mentioned, 1,700 individuals um, have received the the previous iterations of the bursary. An additional 1,700. Uh, will receive uh, the update that we just provided today. So in total, 3,400 Albertans um, from, from last year have received this new bursary. Uh, the, the bursary is funded to continue over the next uh, three years. Um, but uh, I don't have the, the, detail, the specific details in front of me about um, how many individuals in, in what different income categories have received the bursary or were you looking for other demographic information uh, i'm no, sure we can specific to the ones that have received uh, the bursary so far but yeah. i can send an email for that yeah sure send me a follow-up and, and i'm sure we can do some digging and, and get you more of those details okay thank you thank you uh seeing no more questions in the room we'll go over to the phones now operator could you put through the first caller please Catherine Grigowski, Alberta today yeah, good morning, Minister. Um, I'm trying to anticipate what the official opposition's reaction might be to this announcement, and they'll say, hey, that's good, but there was a $690 million cut to post-secondary, and other students are struggling with the cost of living. You know, they've sold their car because they can't afford gas and insurance. Um, they're using the food bank more. Is this the last... Um, affordability measure that we can expect to see for post-secondary students or what else is in the work? Sure. Um, I'll try not to get ahead of myself. Um, no, th this is not the last. Um, there are additional measures and additional supports uh, currently being explored and discussed specifically for post-secondary students and we'll have more to say on that in, uh, in the coming weeks. And to follow up, Catherine? Yeah, um, unrelated, but on the issue of free speech, I, I know that um, in a statement, um, your office has said that um, hate speech is, is not considered free speech, um, but it has to rise to the threshold of the criminal definition. And, and a trend that we're sort of seeing in U.S., U.K., and in Canada, for instance, look, trans people is like arguing 
they they should not exist, which isn't necessarily saying, you know, calling for violence or whatnot, but it may not rise to the level of of criminal. So I'm wondering, how do you how do you balance free speech with somebody saying another marginalized group doesn't have the the right to raise their voice? I mean, how how do you balance this? Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And and uh, obviously, I think it's um, it's an important question. Um, and 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 this is, I think, goes goes to the heart of the issue. Is you know, sh- should I, as the minister, should as the government, uh, decide what you know what speech should be permitted and what speech should not? Um, I think that's that's a very scary proposition. Um, I, I think that there are some very clear goalposts and very clear boundaries outlined when it comes to the topic of, of free speech. Of course, there's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms on the one side that provides uh, every Canadian with the ability to uh, express their views. Uh, then there are also provisions as well within the Criminal Code of Canada that make it illegal to communicate, uh, as an example, to um, uh, to communicate um, uh, speech that's defined as hate speech, which is identified as um, uh, hate uh, or discriminatory language directed to a very uh, particular group of people. Um, and of course, it's, it's not for me to provide interpretation. It's up to uh, our, our judicial process, our provincial courts and federal courts to provide um, uh, court interpretations and rulings if a particular topic or subject or debate touches those goalposts and and needs to be explored and discussed in more detail, um, as uh, as both our, our federal courts and provincial courts have done for the past uh, decade or for the past several decades, um, they continue to receive uh, challenges, questions about interpretation of those two goalposts, goal and and I think it's it's best left to those experts to to provide um, interpretation. But again, I think that this speaks to uh, the heart of the issue, which is that you know, it should be for individuals themselves, and primarily with respect to our university campuses, it should be for individual students themselves to make a decision as to whether or not they want to go listen to a speech or not, uh, or whether they want to go and debate a speaker or not, or whether they want to go and refute the arguments of a speaker or not. Um, you know, many of our, all of our universities and colleges, of course, have their own individual statements on free expression, but one of the important guiding principles that most of our universities and colleges have in their statements is that the university or the institution should not be the decider, should not be um, the, uh, the body or the institution that is uh, deciding or that is shielding students from ideas or opinions that may be unpopular or, or even offensive. Um, and I think that's, that's important more broadly as it relates to the purpose of a university and college. Uh, of course, one of the main reasons a university and a college or a place of higher learning exists is so that different ideas can be debated and discussed. And as, as an individual who spent uh, a decade or you know, 10 years in the post-secondary system earning, earning my PhD, one of the critical skills my post-secondary experience um, allowed me to develop was the ability to refute arguments I disagreed with, was the ability to counter uh, somebody else's narrative in a constructive, intellectual, and, and academic way. And I think that's an important skill for every student to be able to really develop and strengthen uh, and, and to them uh, in their lives uh, moving forward. Thank you for your questions, Catherine. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Alana Smith, Globe and Mail. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question's for the minister, it's about Athabasca University. I'm wondering if you ever indicated that you wanted uh, former President Peter Scott removed from his role. Sorry, can you, I didn't hear the entirety of the question. Can you repeat it? Sure, yeah. Did you ever indicate that you wanted President Peter Scott removed from his role? No. The, the decision about um, who uh, the, the uh, president of the, uh, of the university, and not just within the context of Athabasca University, but of course with all of our universities and colleges, is the um, direct hire and employee of the Board of Governors. Uh, they have complete autonomy and authority to make those decisions. 
the government of Alberta and I have never uh, interfered or involved ourselves in that process with any of our post-secondary institutions. Uh, that's um, uh, a, a decision that is made entirely by the Board of Governors independently. And did you have a follow-up, Alana? I do, yes. So the chair said the process to fire Scott and then hire Clark was not best practices. I'm wondering if that concerns you or if you're concerned in general about the governance at the Athabasca University. Sure. Uh, well, of course, the uh, again, the Board of Governors, not just at Athabasca University, but at all of our universities and colleges, have, have their own procedures, have their own set of bylaws, have their own um, requirements and uh, governance uh, structures, committees, processes. Um, and uh, I, I would say if, if there's any individual of, of the board at Athabasca who believes the proper process wasn't followed, I, I know within the bylaws of Athabasca University there are procedures and processes for individuals uh, mem or members of the board to uh, bring forward a complaint or a concern and there are procedures for dealing with that. So if there are any members of the board who believe that uh, the proper process wasn't followed, I'd encourage them to defer to their, their bylaws and to the process that's laid out. Uh, I don't think it's, it's the best position for the minister to get involved in uh, managing or uh, different boards. Um, the government, of course, appoints the boards or the, the majority of folks on the boards, but it's critical to leave the institutions to manage their own affairs independent and in an autonomous way. Um, and so I, I trust and have full confidence that um, if there are some issues that they'll be properly addressed uh, through the appropriate process. Thank you for that question. Now, operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Bell Fontaine, CBC. Uh, hi, Minister. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. I'm going to follow up on what uh, you just uh, told Alana. You're, you're saying to us that the, the board is independent, you don't interfere in these processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, Minister, you fired a previous board chair and installed somebody else last spring. You've also also removed a bunch of uh, board, uh, governor, or, uh, sorry, members of the board. The governor installed a whole other group of them. So I'm just wondering how you can say to Albertans that you haven't interfered in the process. Sure. Well, well, there's there's a difference here, of course. Um, where the the government of Alberta appoints the the chair, uh, not just again of Athabasca, but of all of our. Uh, 21 public post-secondary institutions and appoints a majority of board members. And the reason the government does that is to, um, is to uh, because well, part of the other uh, reasons or part of the other objectives of government is to provide a mandate and a direction to all of our post-secondary institutions. Um, right here at Mount Royal University um, and all universities, there's a mandate statement. There are clear outcomes and, uh, and objectives that are communicated to the institution, and, and uh, this this works across all of the institutions. And then subsequently, if you're going in a particular direction, you need to have people around the table uh, who bring that expertise that are going to help fulfill that objective. Um, it's a standard uh, practice in, in governance. You, you establish the direction, you look for this, the skill set, and uh, the individuals that you need to help get you in uh, down that that down that path and in that direction. So, um, with uh, with the former board chair of Athabasca, there were some some challenges there with respect to the direction uh, government was asking the institution to go. Which I would just remind um, just just remind you and others that you know the, the government from the very beginning, specifically with Athabasca, you know we. We tried to provide as much deference to the institution as possible. In my communication to the board at the very beginning, I had stated that we would like to see the uh, executive and administrative functions and offices be based in the town of Athabasca, and we requested that the university build us a plan that would get us there. And we left it very open-ended. I, I, at that time, didn't say that this needed to be done by this specific date or time, because I wanted to make sure that the university built a plan that, that worked. Um, but um, if uh, but it was clear that there was there was um, um, there wasn't strong alignment there with um, and uh, additional individuals uh, needed to um, to be brought in that had greater um, 
uh, greater knowledge of local community dynamics, more exposure to uh, some of the challenges of the local region to help facilitate that. So I don't think that this is uh, contradictory. The government sets the high level objective, provides individuals on the boards to fulfill that objective. And as I, as I reiterated through the entirety of our discussions with Athabasca, um, I always left the decisions up to them about how would we get there? What would it take to have administrative offices in the town? What would that require? What do you need from government? What kind of timeline would that entail? Uh, so I think that um, the government's track record on providing deference and autonomy to the institution uh, in Athabasca, in this case, but to all, to make their own decisions is very clear. And Michelle, did you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so, Minister, I mean, how do you respond to the criticism that what happened with Athabasca University is placing a chill on any university president or post-secondary president or board, and their boards of governors in the province to actually assert their independence as they're supposed to do from, from what your government wants to do, like the government's direction? Because they are supposed to be independent, right? So, so how, how do you respond to the fact that this is, this is going to put a chill on, on, uh, on university administrators and executives? Well, in this particular situation, this, this has nothing to do with the government of Alberta. The, the Board of Governors at Athabasca University uh, manages their employee, and um, they, they have their reasons, I'm sure. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what they are um, or the details of it. I'm, uh, I believe there's, there's uh, some uh, confidentiality surrounding um, uh, around that decision. I defer you to, to chat with uh, the board chair or the board members at Athabasca University for more specifics and details as to uh, why the individual was, um, was let go. But I can assure you the government of Alberta is not involved at that level and will not be. Thank you so much, Michelle. Operator, do we have any more questions in the queue? There are no other questions on the phone at this time. Thank you. That'll conclude uh, today's announcement. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Great.